Welcome everyone <laughs> to the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Really wonderful to be here together and wonderful to, yeah, be continuing our travels on the old path with white clouds. Again, if you've been following with us all the way to, God, we are really far along. I think we're at chapter 53. Uh, wonderful. If this is your first time, wonderful. It's a, a beautiful book that kind of traces the historic life of the Buddha, and we get to follow along with him and find ourselves learning with the Buddha as he is coming into new awareness and new understanding, especially of what it's like to have a large spiritual community. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting. Um, last week, we talked, of course, about how we manage conflicts with others, difficulties, the weight and the burden of like small conflicts and how we carry those with us. Um, and, and this week, it's so sweet. We get the first opportunity to learn about um, the four immeasurable practices, uh, the four uh, abodes of the heart. And sometimes we call these the Brahma Viharas. That's one way these practices are called. And they just are, are such a sweet way to be with and manage all of the difficulties of our emotional lives. And as I was just saying with Claudia, we get so many opportunities to have challenging emotions in our day-to-day -day life. So many opportunities to practice these Brahma Viharas. Um, I thought it would be a sweet way to practice them together by actually practicing each one in a single practice. So just a little bit, just like a taste. Um, we'll talk more about the Brahma Viharas, but just kind of a little bit about them is there are four of them and each one of them is associated with helping us overcome different emotional issues or different emotional um, challenges and in different Traditions of Buddhism, um, some of you may be very familiar that Buddhism encompasses a, quite a range of different practices, largely coming from different parts of the world. So when Buddhism began in India, of course, all Buddhists were in India around the Buddha. And then over thousands of years, it just traveled and migrated and moved to different parts of the world, like Japan and Myanmar, uh, to China, uh, moved to Tibet, of course. And in these locations, you know, different kind of, I don't know the right word, but I guess the different conditions in each of these countries led to different interpretations of Buddhism and different focuses. So even though you have these core teachings at the very root, you have just such a beautiful variety and manifestation of different practices um, you know, you see, especially in Tibetan Buddhism, like if you think of if anyone has ever seen a Tonka or a Tibetan Buddhist temple, it is like a psychedelic dream scene, right? It's like colors and fire and dragons. And it's, you know, mixing with the shamanic culture that was uh, in Tibet, you know, originally. And then you see, go to a, a Japanese Zen temple a little different, right? Like about as simple and elegant as you could imagine, right? And in that way, combining, you know, some would say with the samurai culture starting out in Japan. So we just have these different ways that these teachings are manifest, not only in the aesthetics, but manifest in what is focused upon. And in the four measurables practices, there are these four different types. So I hesitated naming them because they actually are in listed in a different order in different traditions. So I, I really like, I have, I personally learned the order of loving kindness, meaning a desire to really support that everyone would not only be happy, but would know the causes of happiness. So not just the temporary happy, but really know the causes. Compassion, that everyone would know and feel a sense of what leads to our suffering and be free from that suffering. Then we have the sympathetic joy, which is our ability to really resonate and rejoice with the goodness that is in others all around us. And then equanimity, which we've talked about recently here. Sometimes people find this, you know, a bit more challenging, uh, a bit harder. Equanimity is our ability to have a sense that all beings 
are equally deserving of our care and consideration. All beings actually are in some ways, hmm, trying to think of the right way to say it, equally flawed, equally wonderful. And our ability to hold them in that space, recognizing not only it might be the beings who have that, um, but even phenomena and other experiences. We To hold someone in equanimity is to kind of have this sense that uh, we're able to find a balance. We're able to find the spaciousness. So even it doesn't mean we have to feel nothing and be aloof. But we can recognize, like, I like this or I don't like this and see some space around those preferences, around that judgment or aversion. Um, so that's the, that's the way I learned them. What I think is interesting is different traditions will start with compassion. Like before we can wish someone love and that they, sorry, before we wish someone happiness, that they could find happiness, we need to be able to wish for them a sense of being free from suffering. Like we actually have to start there. So it's, I, I also understand that, like I respect and admire that. And then, especially in some of the, um, the later Tibetan traditions, you have to start with equanimity. If you don't start with equanimity, even if you have compassion and kindness and joy, it's too referential, it's too self-oriented. So I'm compassionate, but I'm compassionate to these people, you know, existing in this plane of reality, in a very fixed way. But our ultimate goal by these are immeasurable practices, boundless practices, is that we can actually move towards a kind of compassion that we don't even need a person to be the object. Like it's just like radiating compassion. It becomes a stance, right? It becomes part of how we just move through the world. It's like informing the database of our perception. And yeah. That's, I see why you might need equanimity for that, right? Just this understanding of all things being the result of causes and conditions. Because when you recognize that everything is the result of causes and conditions, it's really hard to like hold a grudge or hold a preference. We recognize that this person who we love, like, oh God, like I really hope Todd comes tonight. It's gonna be a good night if Todd comes, right? But unfortunately, like Todd might move away. Then what? Like cause and conditions change, like who we're close to, what we care about, always changing. So I can still hold care and kindness towards Todd, even though things might shift and change around him. I don't expect them to be the same. And then maybe it's like, oh, here's Claudia. Now she's here two weeks in a row. Now it's only good if Claudia is here, right? And so just really getting on to how we so quickly identify what we like and what we don't like, and we get stuck there. And with equanimity, we can, you know, I can see or feel how we might have a greater sense of being able to have our heart really leading with that kindness and that compassion and that joy. So even though my, 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 my teaching has primarily been learning this with kindness first, tonight we're going to do an experiment together, starting with equanimity. Mm -hmm. And then we will move to kindness, compassion, and rejoicing. And again, this will this will be brief because we could spend weeks on each of these. And, and I hope we do. We have in the past. Um, and this weekend, we're going to really focus um, on kindness and compassion. So uh, there's a half day on Saturday, early plug. Uh, but I thought it'd be nice to get us going and yeah, kind of nurturing the heart with these practices. It's just so helpful and beautiful um, to have the support of knowing how to be with these difficult parts of us and not that we not that we need to kind of focus and get stuck on these practices but that we find our way through these practices to a state of more spacious open awareness so we've been focusing a bit on that spacious awareness through a bunch of different doors like can we focus on our breath and get so steady on our breath that then awareness becomes more present do we focus on our own heart, like the Tonglen practice and suffering, and then go into awareness? We're looking for all these different ways to connect to, in some ways, the potential uh, of our consciousness or the potential of our mind so that we aren't just totally caught up in our day-to-day -day worries and our day-to-day -day difficulties and our day-to-day -day identity project of who we are and who other people are, just 
giving ourselves that space. So that's a huge preamble, as I love to do. And uh, now we will go ahead and get into practice. Um, if folks want to, they're welcome to get a blanket or a cushion. There is space on the floor. Um, if people want to sit on the floor, I know these seats are tight together. And um, if you want to unhook the chair and give yourself some more space, you're welcome to do so. For folks at home, get your extra cozy blanket, maybe a kitty if you have one that can sit on your lap. Always good. Take your time. Posture is so important. Um, really worthwhile to find a posture that gives you a sense, like a felt sense in the body and mind of what's going on, right? That we're moving into a posture for, for meditation, a different posture that we might hold. If we were about to write an essay, a different posture that we might hold if we were talking with a friend, Let's really feel into this posture of practice. It can be very supportive for our posture to have a sense of real softening through the front of the body. A softening through the face and the chest and the belly. And find a sense of uprightness through the spine. And give ourselves an opportunity here to both find the uprightness and expand the chest by inhaling our shoulders up to our ears. And then exhaling them down our back. Twice more, inhaling our shoulders up to our ears. And exhaling down our back once more. As we begin, we can naturally give our mind a place to rest by following the breath. Thich Nhat Hanh, in this beautiful book, many times emphasizes just the joy of breathing. Breathing in and knowing we are breathing in. And breathing out, dwelling in this present moment.
So of course the mind will be busy. Our attention will get pulled away, swept up in thoughts, memories, images, planning. And each time you notice, just relax, be very gentle, but return the attention with clarity, following the breath, giving yourself this beautiful opportunity to know that you are breathing in and then dwell in the present moment of the breath. And as we're settling into the breath, we may find and connect with a sense of stillness in the body. Of course, there are many sensations that are shifting and changing, but this voluntary stillness, we are not going anywhere, doing anything. And a voluntary stillness that can be felt in the mind, even with thoughts coming and going, is there a stillness of our awareness amid the coming and going of thoughts and memories and images? While it may feel remote or challenging to consider this, it's possible for us to fully inhabit the breath, to have it be the epicenter of our attention, to have a sense of absorption within nothing but the breath, inhaling and exhaling. Maybe it's only one breath in which we find ourselves fully absorbed in our attention and awareness. It's wonderful. 
one full breath of presence. while still maintaining awareness of the breath. Bring attention to all the sensations in the body and a sense of the body as a unified field of tactile sensations. And feel the fullness of presence in the body. even though we are always in the body, it can be quite amazing to really feel what it's like to unify body and mind, to come home and recognize that there could be many streams of experience. Of course, our sensory experience, sound and touch and smell. And if our eyes are closed, maybe just a bit of light behind them. And another stream of experience in the body is related to an emotional state or feeling. We might notice a sense of heaviness or ache or a sense of vibrancy. With a real kind, curious attention. Bring full attention and awareness into the body. Now that we've settled a bit into the body, to the breath, we can set our intention or motivation for being here. And tonight I'll offer a couple motivations drawn straight from the text. One of the core motivations for practice is the reality of impermanence. Remembering that this precious life one where we are able and capable <clears throat> to receive the 
teachings. So rare, so wonderful, amazing opportunity. Recognizing that this body will get older and get sick, most certainly leave this world, as will the bodies of every being close to us and far from us. And the motivation to practice is one that helps us find the ways to steady the heart and mind, allowing us to be with the ongoing changes, the ongoing reminders of impermanence. Learning to steady our breath, no matter what the context. There's preparation both for our own death and being with the dying of others who we care about. In addition to the motivation of impermanence to fuel our practice, we think of the motivation of bodhicitta, an awakened heart, that natural desire to be of support, to care for others. This motivation can remind us that even though our practice is internal, everyone and everything is included in the purpose of our practice. As we shift into our four immeasurables practice, we shift into the heart, into the mind, into imagination, visualization. And we started with, with this heart of bodhicitta for all beings. And equanimity is our ability to really feel there is no boundary of our care and compassion. We can feel and imagine that all the beings in this room, all the beings in this city, this state, this country, this planet, each and every one of them wants to be happy and free from suffering. And each and every one of them is deserving of care and kindness. So tuning in at the heart <clears throat> and really feeling a sense of boundless care. Just the potential of this heart to open and open and open.
This doesn't mean that we need to shift or change anything we're doing. It's shifting and changing our perspective, making us ready for whenever the need of compassion or kindness or rejoicing arises. With equanimity, we, we hold the joys and the sorrows of the world at once. Without preference, without aversion, so much is painful and horrible in the world. So much is beautiful and awe-inspiring in the world. Each moment, over and over. Equanimity is sometimes called even-heartedness, the strength of the open heart, ready and pliable for whatever emerges, caring and kind, And then shifting our practice now to one of loving kindness. Generating a heartfelt aspiration that all beings could know a sense of joy and flourishing. And that all beings would know the causes and conditions that lead to joy and flourishing. So they could seek them out and find them. The true causes of our flourishing, of course, come within from the deep goodness that we already are. So with our next breaths, we inhale and generate this sense of kindness for all beings. And exhale, may all beings be united with their true nature. May all beings know sustained happiness and well-being. Inhale, drawing in. Exhale, may all beings know the true causes of happiness. And continuing on the rhythm of your own breath, and seeing if you can imagine the sense of radiating out in circles of light across this whole galaxy, sense of well being. Kindness. Mm, with our next inhale, remembering that we are one of those beings also deserving of this aspiration, may I, like all other beings, know the true causes of happiness. May I be connected 
to the intrinsic goodness of my own being. Noticing it might be harder to wish for ourselves than to others, no problem. This is a practice, an exercise. And just keep strengthening. And shifting our attention away from kindness and love and towards compassion and the alleviation of suffering. Generating the heartfelt aspiration that all beings could be free from their suffering. And that all beings could be free from the true causes of their suffering. Inhale, drawing in this heartfelt aspiration. Exhale, may all beings be free from suffering and the true causes of suffering. Inhale, drawing in. Exhale, may beings be free of aversion, delusion, and craving. As we draw those breaths in and extend out, including those we love and know, those we don't know, and including ourselves, may I also be free from suffering and its true causes. And imagine this radiating out again in circles of light across the city, the state, the country, the planet, and beyond, just extending and extending. And while still riding the beauty of compassion, shifting our attention more fully to rejoicing. This heartfelt aspiration to really see and know the goodness in other beings. And feeling this aspiration that all of us could rejoice in the goodness of one another. Rejoicing, not just in the superficial, looking good or achievement, but that deep goodness of the caring, compassionate heart, that deep goodness of wisdom and insight. On the next inhale, drawing in this heartfelt aspiration of rejoicing. And exhale, may all beings delight in the goodness of one another. Inhale, drawing in. Exhale, may we be free from jealousy and open to seeing the good virtue in all beings, letting that lift us, lighten our hearts. And with this view of equanimity, recognizing that all beings have this goodness, all beings can be rejoiced. And including ourselves, inhale, drawing in, 
and then heartfelt aspiration. May I too be rejoiced and rejoicing in my own goodness and the goodness of others. And as we extend these circles farther and farther out of our empathetic joy, just find ourselves resting in the field of equanimity, loving kindness, compassion, and joy. Feeling this body as a body of equanimity, compassion, kindness, and joy. And without any specific reference point, just allowing these feelings to move through us breath by breath. Extending this awareness and experience of the four measurables beyond the body, feeling an awareness of these qualities all around us. Allowing our awareness to be both within the body and not limited to the body, more spacious. And when you hear the bell ring, see if you can maintain this presence and awareness with the four measurables. Not as though this part of the practice is over, just extending in a different way. Thank you for your practice. That was a good experiment. I'd love to hear from folks, uh, reflections, questions. And for folks online, you can raise your little yellow hand or whatever color it is. And uh, folks in the room, the regular hand. Todd, is that a question? And can I ask you to bring the mic towards you? Maybe so I can add you. Thank you, Sylvia. Sure. I was just curious if you could say something about like the, it's like the compassion and the um, loving kindness seem really similar to yes. me. Yes, so great have, question. A lot of people have that. And and I, I think in contempt, this is just my um experience that in contemporary Theravadan teachings, they are they're used kind of synonymously. People say love and kindness, compassion, like it's the same. Um, and they are so similar. Like I understand why we might kind of group them together. 
I find there to be such a richness in their distinction. And part of it is, as I was describing, that there's these different approaches to the ordering of these practices. And, and I have heard, for example, Sharon Salzberg say that she actually thinks it's important to start with compassion, then loving kindness. And often, you know, the ways these practices are taught in a contemporary context is for ourselves, for people we like, for people we don't know, and for those people, right? Like those hard people. And in order for us to practice, we actually have to kind of make our own vessel steady. And to make our vessel steady, we have to attend to like the pain that's here, right? That all of us are carrying uh, for different reasons, at different acuities at different times. So I really can see how that specific attention to, wow, my suffering, I'm going to be kind to my suffering. But when we're kind to our suffering, you know, it's, it's like a, it's like that mother attending to the child in the night who is screaming and the child can't tell you why it's just this, you know, it's, it's, I love that image from the tradition. It's just so beautiful. Um, and with the loving kindness, it's like, I would, I, this is a, you know, experiment here. I haven't heard this written before, but it's more like getting excited when your kid is graduating from school. Like, wow, like, I, I'm so excited for you're doing so great. It's a different kind of joy or not. I don't want to use joy because then we get into empathetic joy, a different kind of happiness. Like, wow, may you have success and satisfaction. May you feel good. Saying all that, that's at the samsaric level, right? Where we just want people to feel a little less pain and a little more happy. But if we really have deep compassion, loving kindness for them, then I was kind of adding in those, um, those phrases of the loving kindness is, may you know the true source of your loving kindness, which is nothing out there. It's already here. May you be connected to your Buddha nature, to the sense of intrinsically already okay. But I think in our contemporary um, secular times and contemporary contemporary times period, it's a, it's a hard sell to tell people the best thing that you could ever imagine is already in here, not out there. It's just nothing is reinforcing that to us. It's just not what we see or hear or are rewarded for. And so I think it makes sense for us to operate at both levels. It's actually incredibly kind with loving kindness to want someone to have a better job you know, to be recognized, to feel cared for. I'm like, that's great. And obviously it's compassionate to want someone to not suffer at the form body level, right? And not suffer from loneliness and feelings of um, rejection, anxiety. But ultimately we want people with the level of compassion to really get clear on the true sources of their suffering, which is going to be delusion, craving, aversion, right? Not like I really dislike my neighbor who's so loud, but if I'm really compassionate for someone who's suffering with that, my compassion would be for them to recognize the added suffering they create over their loud neighbor. So my compassion isn't just for them to feel like they can have a new apartment. It's for them to learn to be with whatever emerges. That's a, it's an absolutist view. You know, so I think we need both. Like, I really do. Like, a loud neighbor is no joke. Not being able to sleep, horrible. Um, so, it, you know, I, I don't want to just go ultimate level and relative doesn't matter. But I think with both of those, they have such a different quality of what we're wishing for people. And I really, uh, <clears throat> my, start, my one woman campaign of let's not condense loving kindness and compassion. Let's keep them separate. I think it really helps and helps us with what we're offering. It helps us with our aspirations for ourselves or others. Thank you for that great question. Yeah. And I think it feels different in the body. Compassion. I know I'm probably still a little too over-invested, but compassion is this like down on the earth feeling of, you know, with the sorrow of the world. 
And for me, the loving kindness is kind of the buoyancy. Um, so, yeah. Other questions or reflections on the practice? I know there was a lot of steps, sometimes tough when there's a lot of steps, but if you miss a step, it's okay. Curious from folks, how was the, we didn't do that sequence of yourself and the loved ones, but we just went to everybody. How was that for folks to kind of go broader just from the start? Oh, I see a hand. <clears throat> Hi there. Hi. So I was just um, had a thought around the distinction for me between um, loving kindness and compassion. And I feel like compassion allows me to uh, decrease or lessen that feeling of otherness between myself and whoever the other might be, but in a difficult situation, perhaps, but loving kindness more for me at least allows me to figure out what to do like what the action should be mm. like like what would love do in this situation that's beautiful mm. thank that's you for sharing yeah i love that what would love do yeah yeah any other Thoughts or questions? Yes, please. Hey, teamwork. Yeah. Um, I found it um, in terms of your question about everybody versus the smaller view. I found I found it um, easier to do it for everybody, and I was reflecting on the practice last week, which I saw from YouTube, which is sort of you called it a high level of thing of ringing up somebody who. You know, I don't know, I don't know, no, they're wrong, they're wrong. You know, and I found, and I, part of the practice last week was really making me understand how difficult yeah. this is. And so if I don't think about that person, yeah. I can feel compassion for the world in a sort of an abstract, maybe, yes. you know, yeah, everybody deserves <laughs> kindness and great. But, you know, but if I have to think about particular people, it's much you know that 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 uh, is much more rooted in yeah. my um, preferences and yeah you know and i you know they're bad and they did this and they did that and but everybody it's like so there's just something i don't know in response to your question that's wonderful about that. yeah and, and i think that's such a good a good point and in some ways it's it's nice to feel the naturalness of the aspiration <clears throat> even if in the specific and with the people it gets harder like to, to feel that, oh, that would be nice. That would, be, I really want that. That's natural. And that is also, I think, being able to overcome a sense of there's no way I could care for everyone, which can often be an obstacle for people. Like, wait, every, wait no, I can barely handle my family. You want me to consider everyone? Um, so it's, it's beautiful, right? That, you, that everyone actually does feel natural. And this beautiful paradox that um, my teacher often shares that we can, it's, it's just so much harder to only care about our own suffering than it is to care about everyone's suffering. But that doesn't make any sense. Why is that, right? It should be harder to think about everybody's, but actually our own is like unbelievably dense and uncomfortable and like, ugh. so that's such a, you know, nice thing to have that sense of openness to others. Um, yeah. And, you know, the specific people, they're in there too. We just don't have to like focus on them. <laughs> yeah, like, we get like a, yeah, I, um, a mantra I've been working with this week where there are those difficult people is they're trying their best, like he or she, or they, <clears throat> they're trying their best. Um, <clears throat> it's so, simple and down on the ground and it's so compassionate but it doesn't feel too flowery 
Because, you know, a lot of the reasons that we have a hard time feeling compassion or kindness towards others is because they're being jerks. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's the result of causes and conditions and then our stuff and then their stuff. But it doesn't, it's like it's hard. And so that, that little phrase just brings into, yep, cause and conditions, they're, they're doing their best, um, which is still pretty hard for some circumstances and situations that we see, you know, near and far, like read about in the news or see in our own lives. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Any other thoughts? Yes. Um, I'm curious if it's possible to give everybody compassion if you don't do it to yourself first, because yes. you just love yourself before you can people. And we kind of went straight to everybody. Yes, it's the essential eternal question. Um, and I think so. I, I have a, I vacillated on this over the years because. Oh, sorry. The question: Can we actually feel compassion for others if we don't have it for ourselves? Um, and this might be surprising, but I'm going to say yes. It's just not sustainable. So we can have compassion for others while not feeling it for ourselves. And that is your like number one ticket to burnout, right? Because you're just giving it and giving it and giving it. Because, it, you know, I uh, used to work here at SF General Hospital for many years, way before I learned self-compassion. And I offered like incredible love. I felt such tenderness and care to the patients I worked with. And um and I wasn't yet able to do that for myself. I'm not saying I've like, I have transitioned fully out of that stage, um, but I've been practicing. So I think we can, but I do think it it's so important for us to prioritize our practice of that for ourselves. But I think we always have to keep in mind who it's for. And I think it can be actually helpful to practice compassion for ourselves in service of compassion for others. So then again, we can avoid this like self-centeredness with our compassion. I can, like, I'm, I'm all for self-compassion. I'm all for the research on self-compassion. There are like actually very good results that compassion practice is as good as a general secular mindfulness practice, if not better in terms of empathy and overall well-being and reducing anxiety and symptoms of depression. And this culture loves being self-obsessed. And if we do the self-compassion, like it just is hard for it to not become like self, 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 self. And yeah, just really keeping in mind our goals. of Why are we doing this? And to what purpose? That'll keep our practice more balanced. And also if we struggle to think we deserve that self-compassion, anybody? Yeah, me, y'all, yeah, okay, some honest people in the room. Um, you know, if we struggle to feel we deserve that self-compassion, having the motivation that this really will improve our ability to sustain our compassion for others, that can be great. Wonderful question, thank you. Nope, you're just holding it. Okay, I thought you might have a question. Okay, yeah. I was just curious, we were talking earlier, um, what do you consider, like, or can you name maybe like five compassion practices? Like, I, I think Tonglen counts yeah, as absolutely. a compassion more yeah. than loving kindness. What do you consider like three or four other ones? I, I mean, compassion, the traditional compassion practice is that uh, imagining of another person, right? So the, the very, say like the very traditional is, is, a, is kind of that everybody it's not as specific like all beings Mm -hmm. that they be free from suffering and then there is this sequence of um imagining you know compassion for your own suffering imagine compassion for your loved one or someone you don't know well so that sequence and then there's the non-referential compassion which we did at the end which is like i love that it just helps get out of that, that like transaction of compassion you know, like giving it to you. And it's just like, just this sense of like, this is a body of compassion and I am like radiating compassion. But I, I, I personally find it helpful to like do that more specific referential practice first, um, as opposed to the, it's called like aimless or like targetless compassion. 
Okay. Yeah. So it's similar to loving kindness. Oh yeah. The steps yeah. of it. Totally. Is, is loving kindness then a compassion practice? I, it's a great question. They are loving kindness is just Still loving kindness. A compassion is compassion. <laughs> the one is to promote happiness. One is to relieve suffering. Okay. And I know that's, they're similar, but they're different. You know, like yeah. baby crying in the night. Mm-hmm. I like that. Kid graduating from middle school. You know, like there's like, they're not, you're not like reduce the suffering. Well, actually that's not true. Middle school is total suffering. <laughs> yeah, I said that, but you know what I mean? Like that. Yeah. Uh, I want you to be so happy and I want you to be free from stuff. There's different qualities. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Good. Yeah. Is there another hand? Oh yes, please. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's kind of the same question or not the same question but going off on that it was um interesting when you were um when you when when we got to the point of um may they know the root of suffering or may they know the root of happiness i'm like wait 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 you know i'm still caught up in that you know so how can i be of course, I, I can wish it for them. But at the same time, it's like, no, may I know the root of suffering? May I really? Uh, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's like a wonderful, you know, and I, I really like the word aspiration. Like, I think it's such a lovely word, you know, um, and it is, you know, the heart's aspiration. Like, may they and may I, too, not um, I figured this thing out. May you also figure it out. Right. That feels very pedantic. Um, uh, it's, it's really like just this sense of, yeah, like real richness of how much we can have a sense of like longing really, you know, for that kind of freedom for ourselves and for others. Yeah. You know, and again, um, it's just most of the ways that we try to be happy directly undermines the possibility of our happiness, right? Like that's classic Shanti Deva. Um, like wanting to be good and prove ourselves makes us overwork to the point of like pure exhaustion. Right. And then, um, we just want to avoid the difficult people and the difficult situations. And we end up just, you know, crunching our life into a smaller and smaller place where there's like no possibility of really, um, finding connection and purpose and meaning. So it's like these ways that we normally go about, trying to find freedom from suffering and enjoy happiness are actually like in the way. So it's so compassionate and so kind to wish for those true causes, not just temporary alleviation, right? That's like the deepest we can feel of those qualities is to know them at that level. Great. Yeah, I know it's, it's, it is aspirational. All right. So we'll do a little, thank you, Cage, little here on, um, and it's really, you know, this, how many pages is this book? It is 500 and 572 pages. There's one paragraph on the four measurables. It's like six lines, you know, but I, I'm like, oh my God, this is like one of the most important parts of the book. Um, and yeah, I think I'll, I'll finish up a little bit from our conversation last week before I get into the four immeasurables. Um, just something I find so poignant and um, so heart-wrenching is, you know, the Buddha in his Sangha, um, now he has, you know, he starts off with his five friends and then a hundred and then 500. And now he has centers all over India, which are, you know, beautiful. And um, it's a flourishing Sangha and different centers. And yet in some of these villages or some of these areas where there are temples, there's conflict among the, among the monks. How could this be? And there they are. They have Buddha as their teacher. I mean, my God, how lucky are you? And still, right, there's difficulties. And it's just that I I mentioned this last week, but this big conflict that happens, this huge uh, discord in the Sangha happens at a place called Dosaira. And this came between 
two different members of the Sangha. So in the Sangha, there's a hierarchy because there kind of needs to be hierarchies for things to work right at a certain level. And so you have the younger students, you have the older students, you have what are called a, a precept master. So someone who knows all of the rules, you have a sutra master, someone who knows all the teachings and a precept master and a sutra master get in a disagreement around the sutra master forgot to wash out his bowl. I mean, come on, but like, it's a big deal. Um, and he's pointed out to by the precept master who says, you forgot to wash out a bowl. You have broken a precept. And he says, I, I meant to not wash it and like sticks with that story and divides the Sangha. Right. And Buddha's Buddha comes and he's like, Hey, um, he said, we should not become attached to our own viewpoint. We should listen carefully in order to understand the other's viewpoint. We should seek all means to prevent the community from breaking. He said that to both sides. And he's like, that should be it. We're done. <laughs> months and months and months to go on of this, like of this kind of fractured community. And, you know, I've mentioned this before, but all of these communities at the time, all of these different um, temples, it's so interesting. They all exist entirely on the generosity of the local villagers. And the local villagers are giving them food and building them um, places to sleep in the, in the forest where they're living. And the villagers are really turned off by this conflict. And they're like, we're not even gonna give you offerings. Like you're, this is, what, do, what are you doing? You're, you're making the Buddha upset. Um, and the Buddha says to them, cease your arguing. It's only creating division in the community. Return to your practice. If we truly follow our practice, we will not become victims of pride and anger. Um, and people in the Sangha are, are upset. They don't want to disturb the Buddha. And in fact, um, the Buddha decides to go and spend his very first rainy season retreat. So every year, this is like his 10th year, he has a retreat with at one of the centers and everybody comes to receive teachings. And this year he's like, I'm going to go retreat on my own for the first time since I achieved enlightenment. You kids figure this out on your own, essentially. And, you know, he just he finds himself really needing that space. And I just find this. Like really humbling, right? Like none of none of us has figured this out yet. Like, how do we have communities, even communities brought together by shared spiritual values? There's conflict. People don't do their dishes, you know. <laughs> like, it's um, yeah. I don't know. I, I just found this this quite interesting. And the Buddha found when he was wandering on his like solo retreat, he found one small group of of uh, monks living together, just three of them. And they were living in perfect harmony. Each one of them looked out after the other. Each one of them thought of the other in every action and behavior. And I was like, yeah, three people I could see. 300? It gets harder. And, you know, yeah, I, again, I, I just feel humbled. And some folks know this history and, and some folks don't. But the Dharma Collective is actually kind of has emerged from a crisis in a spiritual community. Um, so we, we used to be part of Against the Stream, which was the uh, the Dharma punks. And there was a big rupture in that community. And I remember, you know, thinking, because this was a generation of folks practicing Buddhism um, that was that was quite different. And I was like, it's going to be different. Oh, we're so radical. That's so cool. I was also a teacher in that Sangha not close to the dispute. I didn't have enough reason to take sides. I just felt the, the sadness of its dissolution. Um, but yeah, it's just, yeah, I guess it's just really humbling. And what ends up happening is when the Buddha returns, um, both sides, the precept master and the sutra master come and want to make apologies to the Buddha. And he says, you, you have to find apologies for one another. And both need to confess their part in the harm. Mm. That's hard. You know, you stuck your heels in for like a year of like not wanting to wash that bowl. And you have to be like, actually, I wanted to wash that bowl. I'm sorry. And I've kind of been a jerk about it for a year. And then the other person who's like, yeah, I'm right. And I shouldn't have been, you know, so insistent on my rightness for a year. 
Um, and so they both, both make their confessions. Um, and we talked a little bit about this last week, confess. It's has a lot of baggage in our contemporary culture, but this idea of being able to own and be responsible for our part in the harm, really important. No matter how wrong someone is, we can also find some way for us to understand the ways we are contributing, right? Um, there are exceptions to that, but in most cases, it's true, right? So I just found that, um, yeah, I found that really, really interesting. It takes up chapters and chapters, which is kind of interesting. Um, Thank you for that. Um, the Buddha recognizes that it takes two to tango. It's yes. Not it's not just you or you. Yes. You know, in yes. any relationship. Yeah. That's what it is. In all relationships. Exactly. You know, and this idea that, you know, because the Buddha, he was just so convinced, like, just practice meditation. And, and he's like, actually, there's more than just practicing meditation. We actually need to be able to find ways to work with our anger and our pride. And sometimes that is, that's a little different. Again, plug for Saturday, we working with anger. Um, it's, it's important for us to have other methods and tools that might include things like communication. So folks here might be familiar with nonviolent communication, another method drawn more from a psychotherapeutic background, but often woven in with the Dharma. How do we communicate with each other with like the living essence of these practices? Just, we got to do it. Got to do it. Because even if you live alone, this will still come up. I assure you. Mm -hmm. I remember in times in my life when I was um, living alone and I was like, man, I'm just killing it. Like, I just like <laughs> equanimity all the time, confusion. And then, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? I got this. And then you're like at home with your family for a week, or like you do start a relationship and someone moves in, you're like, oh, wow, I got work to do. <laughs> right? So, yeah, it's beautiful to, and again, even in these monastic communities, this, of course, is going to come up and I just love that it's included in this book. It's not just everybody's in the forest and things are so beautiful. Like, no, there's real conflict. Um, and then uh, I, you know, a couple of weeks back, we were talking about what it's like to be the Buddha's father, which, you know, is beautiful and hard. Um, and the Buddha is really tough love with his dad who just misses his son and wants him to visit more. And, um, you know, just so sweet. And, then I think about like these next chapters, like what is it like to be the Buddha's son? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so the Buddha was married and, you know, left um, nine months or so after his son was born, didn't return until his son was seven. A lot of different accounts about how invested his wife was in his awakening versus how much he was like, couldn't have you have done that here? Mm -hmm. But in Thich Nhat Hanh's version, he really needed to go away. Um, and, and that was really helpful for him in, in finding his awakening. And then when his father returns, he takes his son and the son becomes part of the Sangha. And so now seven years later, his son, or eight years later, his son is, you know, a teenager and part of the Sangha and his dad doesn't give him any extra treatment and almost in some ways gives him like a little bit of a harder time right? Wanting him to do well. And he discovered that his son had told kind of a, a meaningless fib. They don't say what the fib is, but his son had lied to someone, um, I think trying to cover up on something he had done. And the Buddha says, you know, when you lie, what does he say here? Um, so he's pouring, his son is pouring out water so that the Buddha can wash his feet. And then the water's almost entirely out of the jug. And so his son, Rahula, he says, Rahula, is there a little or a lot of water in this basin? He said, there's very little left. The Buddha said, you should know that a person who does not tell the truth has little integrity left as the water in this basin. Burn. <laughs> Rahula was silent. The Buddha poured out the remaining water and asked his son, Rahula, do you see how I have emptied all the water out? Yes, I see. Those who continue to tell untruths lose all their integrity just as this basin has lost all its water. 
the Buddha turned the basin upside down and asked, Rahula, do you see this basin is turned upside down? Yes, I see. If we don't practice correct speech, our integrity is turned upside down like this basin. Don't tell fibs, even in jest. Rahula, do you know why one uses a mirror? Yes, a mirror is used to look at one's reflection. Just so, Rahula, regard your own actions, thoughts, and words as a person who looks into the mirror. But I love that teaching, right? Like, don't just, you know, look at your your hair and your style, like imagine all your words were your reflection. Mm-hmm. And I was mentioning that last week of if, if our grievances showed up like bruises on us, we'd probably try to like clean it up a little, hold a little less grudges, but like, how do we really see a reflection of ourselves? So whew, I, yeah, that's a, you know, a tough one from your dad who's enlightened um it's like you think like you know your parents don't understand um i can only imagine it must be hard to have buddha as a dad um and and there's another part where rahula and all the other monks are are walking um in mindfulness and they are walking towards the village and and rahula is distracted um he ends up thinking actually about what it would have been like to be the son of the Buddha if the Buddha had remained a king. Mm -hmm. These are like the kind of daydreams I'm like always all about. I'm like, what if I grew up in LA? Who would I be now? Like just this like simple, you know, it's it's not like harmful, right? He's not like thinking of doing any malice, but it's just this kind of natural daydreaming. But the Buddha, again, so hard to have the Buddha as a dad. Buddha like reads his mind. Right. And he's like, are you paying attention to your breath right now? And he's like, (laughs) and all the other bhikkhus are like, oh, my God, me neither. And um, but Rahula is like, he's so he's so um, he's so hurt. He goes to the forest and he's like. um, He says mm -hmm, his friend Sfasti comes after him and Sfasti, he says to Sfasti, I'm just so ashamed. I was, uh, I feel so ashamed. I'd rather sit here alone and meditate. And so he sat there and then on the way back, the Buddha kind of came, um, to see him and the Buddha understood that Rahula was ripe to receive certain teachings. He said, Rahula learn from the earth. Whether people spread pure and fragrant flowers, perfume or fresh milk on it, or discard filthy and foul smelling feces, urine, blood, mucus and spit on it, the earth receives it all equally without clinging or aversion. When pleasant or unpleasant thoughts arise, don't let them entangle or enslave you. Learn from the water, Rahula. When people wash dirty things in it, the water is not sad or disdainful. Learn from the fire. Fire burns all things without discrimination. It's not a shame to burn impure substances. Learn from the air. The air carries all fragrances, whether sweet or foul. Rahula, practice loving kindness to overcome anger. Loving kindness has the capacity to bring happiness to others without demanding anything in return. Practice compassion to overcome cruelty. Compassion has the capacity to remove suffering of others without expecting anything in return. Practice sympathetic joy to overcome hatred. Sympathetic joy arises when one rejoices over the happiness of others and wishes others well-being and success. Practice non-attachment to overcome prejudice. Non-attachment is the way of looking at all things openly and equally. This is because that is. That is because this is Mm. myself and others are not separate. Do not reject one thing only to chase after another. Rafula, loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy, and non-attachment are beautiful and profound states of mind. I call them the four measurables. Practice them and you will become a refreshing source of vitality and happiness for others. Rahula, meditate on impermanence in order to break through the illusion of self. Meditate on the nature of the body's birth, development, and death in order to free yourself from desires. Practice observing your breath. Mindfulness of the breath brings great joy. So that is quite a profound teaching. Um, 
What page he, is that? This is page 321. Yeah. yeah, it's really beautiful. And, you know, it's it's kind of heartbreaking to, to read this passage. You know, the earth receives everything, no matter what you put on it. But as we know, like, though it is receiving it, it, it still is poisoned. Right. And, and the water might receive everything, but the water becomes polluted in our air is, um, but it's I really I, I really feel like just the. Yeah, just the kind of tangible nature of imagining ourselves with these qualities of the earth and of the water, of air, and that we have that capacity within us to receive. Um, and it's just so yeah, it's just so interesting that he goes from that kind of impartiality of the natural world. It's just the natural world receives everything and then invites us to find these abodes of the heart practices. That's the entire teaching on these practices right there. Um, so beautiful. And, and here, you know, specifically, and this is very traditional, pairing loving kindness with anger. You can have loving kindness with and towards and as a result of and helping you overcome any emotion. That's my humble opinion and what I've seen um, possible. But I like that there are these specific antidotes that we apply to specific emotions. So we'll talk more about that. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to hear if anybody had questions on this part of the passage or comments on how much it would be hard to be the Buddha's son. Um, yeah. Any any questions on this part of the practice? This part of this this story of the Buddha? Or comments? Yeah, well. We, we do the handoff. Um yeah, I was just um something just crossed my mind regarding um the time of the Buddha and the times that we live in now, yeah. or in particular, uh, it's people um, could deny, uh, this is on a broader scale, people could deny agency. You had kings, um, rulers who made decrees, and this is how things were. And like, I'm just an individual, there's nothing I can do about it. In today's society, at least in most Western societies, people have some degree of agency in terms of saying uh, this, this is cruel, this is wrong. Um, there is something that I can do yeah. about this. And hmm. um, I, again, it just maybe it came up because like you mentioned, you know, pollution and, yeah. and, and those sorts of things. Yeah. And um, yeah, it, it just it, it causes me some concern. I, I don't know if I'm looking for an answer, but it's yeah. just. And I'm curious because I think it also changes our relationship with um, the four immeasurables in a way. Right. Like, are they passive aspirations or are they something we're going to enact? And I've, I've heard you talk about equanimity before. I love your, your framing of equanimity. I feel like it's very like a natural way that you interact with the world. And like, what does it mean to have a perspective of equanimity versus like, oh, I actually have to enact this, right? And we do have more agency than we did in the time of historical Buddha. I mean, even the kings and princes were kind of bound, right, by these responsibilities to the, their bloodlines, which is why so many of them left and became um, monks. And yeah, and, and I think there is, a, I mean, a huge question, an important question that some teachers and communities are addressing of like, what is engaged Buddhism? Mm -hmm. And this is something was so important to Thich Nhat Hanh, right? He himself was, you know, for more than half his life, probably three quarters of his life, a refugee in exile, right? And um, activism meant so much to him. It wasn't like, oh, I have this really nice retreat center in France. Like, who doesn't want that? I'm just going to hang out, right? It was like how to make these practices come to life. And I think a, one hazard can be like, if we really learn to work with these practices and address our heart, 
it could almost make us feel like we don't need to do anything, right? Mm -hmm. Like, is it a way of learning to just kind of tolerate the distress of living in this ever falling world? Or does it, I mean, the way I love to think about it is it's like doing your high intensity interval training, right? Like that's, and so that when there's a burning building and there's a dog in the second floor window, like you can just run up there and grab the dog, right? Like we're doing this training of the four metrics all the time. So if the opportunity arises for us to act, we are ready. Not necessarily that we're like always when we do it, thinking, how do I do this right now? How do I, because in some ways, mm, like I love the description, very simple here, um, that we need to do these practices without expecting anything in return. That takes a lot of practice, right? A lot of what we do in terms of kindness and compassion, there's a clear expectation, like, oh, someone's going to notice, or, you know, this is good. And um, I, I do love this idea of like, how would you enact simple kindnesses and compassions that no one notices? Mm. It's kind of hard to do, but it's like such a nice thing to think on. That can really be another way we take this practice off the cushion, right? Because when I'm imagining my difficult people and sending them compassion, they don't know. It's stealth. And that's good, mm. right? And I don't expect them to suddenly become <clears throat> easy, wonderful people. So how do we bring that? Um, yeah, into our our agency in our everyday. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I think, let's say, like us as a Sangha here, I think we have an opportunity, you know, to do that. And I think it would be interesting to figure out, like, how do we want to do that? I, I think of our uh, Dia de los Muertos altar that we had, and many of us in this community gathered to make it happen. And it was like such an offering for the community hundreds of people came by was it was a thousand i think I mean, it's like, right. and that was such an offering and, and how do we make an offering like that i'm very open to ideas and suggestions so maybe we can percolate on it or is a community farm alimany farm we can go there anyway or more so thank you for bringing that well yeah so let's take a moment and dedicate our first symbolic act of dedicating this to all beings. So coming back into the breath and the body. And softening through the face and the chest and the belly. And taking a moment and considering if there's anything tonight that might have been stirred or inspired, any new ideas or reflections, then we consider these to be the fruit of our practice and connection. And that we offer this, any benefit of our practice and time here together, that we offer this for the sake of all beings. Imagining that in our time here together, we could radiate out through waves and waves of compassion, loving kindness, empathetic joy and equanimity, that all beings would know peace and ease, all beings would know happiness and its true causes, all beings would be free from suffering and know the causes of suffering, that all beings would rejoice that all beings could be free. Hmm. 